Welcome everybody. We are meeting once again to study A Course in Miracles. We're using my text, A Course in Miracles Made Easy, as the foundation for our study. And we always begin with a short prayer. We recognize that there is a spiritual reason for our coming together, that the Holy Spirit, higher power, is in charge of this meeting, is in charge of our lives. We humbly, assertively turn our lives and this meeting over to spirit. We say that the ego is incapable of constructing anything truly worthwhile, but the ego can cooperate with the spirit and allow what wants to happen to happen. So my prayer is that each and every person here receive a blessing, a healing, an awakening, something happening in your heart that makes a difference in your day and your life. So we are so glad that we're co-creating this day together with our consciousnesses that are joined. And so it is. Thank you. Okay, before we dive in, um, Nishank has a report. Uh, he shared this with our LEAP uh, seminar the other day, but he hasn't shared it with this particular group. So Nishank, do you want to put your video on and uh, briefly tell your story? Yes, sure, Alan. Uh, so about two weeks back, uh, we had uh, our house help uh, tested uh, positive for uh, the COVID-19 and he was taken to the quarantine facility and we were all asked to uh, self-quarantine ourselves at home and uh, there was a panic for a couple of minutes that, oh, this happened, that happened and then we all kept our calm and uh, Fun fact, uh, we are 10 people in the home, including a 85 year old, including a couple of senior citizens, couple of kids. None of us have been tested positive and uh, no zero symptoms of any sort. It's been two weeks now. We just ended our self quarantine period and all is well. Yeah. We chose to believe in uh, wholeness and health and uh, we're all keeping that. Good story. Thank you so much. Great demonstration. You know, we've been talking in this seminar and others about simultaneous parallel realities. And it's possible for one person right next to you to be living in one reality and for you to be living in another. So according to all scientific expectations, it would be highly likely that one or all of the other 10 people in the house would have contracted the virus because here's somebody who's living intimate with you touching your refrigerator, touching your chairs, using your bathroom. And um, not one person out of 10 got it because you're in a different consciousness. So, yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and you yeah. know, Alan, uh, there is a line in the text somewhere it is written that uh, you bring, uh, don't try to bring truth to illusions. If you try yeah. to do that, you yeah. keep them and you keep justifying them and letting them be there with your belief. Yeah. And uh, if you bring illusions to truth, uh, the truth will help you to uh, make it see as unreal. So yeah. uh, that's something that stayed with me. Uh, I'm not denying the fact that the pandemic is there, the virus is there, but I don't wish, I don't choose to accept it as the truth. You know, humanity cannot <laughs> live like this for sure. So it is. Great testimonial. Thank you so much. Okay, so this leads us right into our subject for today which is the dreamer and the dream. Let me get it up for you here. So this is a very, very deep and intrinsic element in the fabric of A Course in Miracles. And I will do my best to explain it to you in simple terms so you can actually live it. So what the Course says, which is what really every major religion has ever said, is that the world that seems so real and so solid is actually an illusion. It's more of a figment of our imagination than a fixed reality. It says the world, in fact, the Course even says there is no world. It says the one central teaching of A Course in Miracles is there is no world. That's pretty radical, isn't it? But what it's saying is that if you were to ask 7 billion people on the planet, what is the world? 
you would have some overlap, but you'd have a lot, a lot, a lot of different answers about what the world is. Some people see it as a beautiful, wonderful place. Some people see it as a horrible place of war. And so each of us lives in the world generated by the thoughts we are holding. And of course, it's over and over and over again that the world is nothing more or less than a blank screen onto which we are projecting our beliefs. It's a movie. And it's no more use to, change, to try to change the world by manipulating the world than it would be to, the run, to the, run to the front of a movie theater. And if you don't like the movie that's playing, start punching or scratching or cutting the screen to get rid of the people you don't like. Because the movie has no reality in itself on the screen. It's just a play of light and shadows. If you really want to change the movie, you have to go into the projection room and take out the movie that's in the projector and replace it with a different one. And then what appears on the screen will be entirely different because the source of the movie has been changed and upgraded. This is why the Course says over and over and over again, seek not to change the world, but choose instead to change your thoughts about the world. Very few people are willing to play at that level. And I often quote Emerson who said, for every one person, for every thousand people hacking at the branches of evil, the tree of evil, there's one who is working at the root, which means that people are always fussing with the manifestations of evil, but they hardly ever say, ask, what evil lives in my mind or what evil lives in the mind of those who perpetrate evil acts. So the course is a go to the source training. It's not an effects training. It is a source training. So let's look at some of the key lessons in the course that underscore this. So the very first sentence, <coughs> the very first chapter, it says there's no order of difficulty in miracle. Now that's a pretty intense statement to make, uh, number one. What does it mean by that? Well, I'll tell you the reason. It says there's no order of difficulty in miracles because there's no order of reality in illusions. So what this is saying is that because everything that seems real in the world is actually a dream, no element of the dream is any more real or solid or formidable than any other. And this is why in the early stages of the course, in early lessons, 30 lessons or whatever, when it's saying uh, this typewriter has no meaning, this coat hanger has no meaning except which I've given it, and it says over and over again, do not make distinctions between the things that you are seeing. Each object you are viewing is an equal candidate for the exercise because each object is equally real or unreal. They're all equally unreal, the Course would say. But in your mind, we say, well, this is cool and this is important. That person's attractive, this person, that person's fat, that person's skinny, that person's black, that person's white. And we, we just make all these distinctions that chop up our mind into little pieces. And then we wonder why we're neurotic. We wonder why we can't sleep. We wonder why we, <laughs> the news scares us. Because we see one element of a dream as more real or formidable than another. Now, here's my famous test. A lot of you have taken it with me because you've taken coach training or Another, another program. So in a dream, in one dream, a bear is chasing you and you're scared. There's a big scary bear that's gonna chase you and eat you in the dream. Okay? I think bears are vegetarians actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, in another dream, there's a whole bunch of bears. We'll say there's 10 bears or 100 bears. Okay, I couldn't find a picture of a lot of bears, but that'll have to do. So 
which the question is in which situation are you in greater danger are you in more danger when a, in one dream one bear is chasing you are you in greater danger in another dream when 10 bears are chasing you so we could go back and forth discussing it couldn't we however there's one answer and the answer is you are not in danger in any situation because both dreams are dreams in other words one dream bear is equally as dreamy as 10 dream bears and because dreams cannot hurt you you are not in danger in either situation got it so it sounds like a silly little exercise but the truth is that it forms the basis of a course in miracles and what it's saying is that a cancer is no more of a threat than a cut on your hand. Now that sounds completely insane, completely outrageous, completely diluted from a medical standpoint. Well, of course, cancer is scary. People die from cancer. Yeah, got it. But what the Course is saying is that your entire body is a dream. All disease is a dream. All the news is a dream. The COVID is a dream. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a thought that we're participating in that seems real because we give it power by focusing on it. Withdraw your power from it and it, has, it cannot hurt you. And this is why the Course wants to say that a coat hanger is the same thing as a typewriter because they're both dream, both elements of the dream and neither one is more powerful or bigger or cooler, or better or worse than another. They're, they're just elements of a dream. Now, sometimes I'll have a kind of nightmare. Sometimes when, before I wake up, if I, if, I, if I sleep in too late, weird things happen in my mind. And uh, one common dream I'll have is uh, I'm giving a lecture and people are not paying attention <laughs> or they're walking out or they're not hearing me. Or it's kind of like, eh, hey, come on, you guys are supposed to be my students here. Well, it's an ego dream. Got it. And then I'll start to wake up. But part of me thinks, no, I have to fix this. <laughs> I have to get people back in the classroom. I have to get them to listen. They have to get them to learn a lesson. I have to get them to pay attention. And part of me wants to stay in the dream so I can fix the dream so the dream changes and I'm happy in it. And meanwhile, another voice saying, dude, I forget about fixing this. It's a dream. Just wake up. If you wake up, the whole scenario goes. You don't have to fix anything. You don't have to get anybody back in their seat. It's, it's just a dream. And sometimes I will toggle back and forth between trying to fix the dream and waking up. And then finally I wake up. Well, you know, I could have woken up 10 minutes ago. Why did I waste my time? trying to fix the dream. And it's, no, it's not really different than, quote, real life, which is not so real after all, that we spend so much energy trying to fix the dream and fix people in the dream. We had a lady call into my radio show a while back, and she said, oh, I'm, I'm really mad because the, <clears throat> the Quaker church does not respect women. And I, I, can you give me your mailing list so I can do a mailing and get the Quaker church to respect women? She went on and on. Said, okay, well, I don't know about the Quaker church. Maybe it respects women or not. But would you like to talk about your fears about it and your sense of powerlessness about it and your sense of anger about it and your sense of resistance? No, no, we got to fix the Quaker church. And, and, you know, I'm not saying the Quaker church is right or wrong. I don't know it that well. But she was unwilling to look at the part of her mind that was participating fear and anger and resistance. And I tell you, that's the only place it could be. Now, maybe the Quaker church needs to be fixed. I don't know. Maybe it could do something about it. I don't know. But in that moment, this woman had, was unwilling to examine her mind as the source of her upset. Because what you resist expands and persists. 
What you hate grows. What you fight gets worse. Why? Because you're investing so much psychic energy in it that you expand. And not to say there are not injustices in the world, not to say that some people don't need to be corrected. You know, people make, make mistakes. We all do. But until you recognize that whoever you see is connected to your mind, you're not going to change them because you are programming them to continue what you hate by hating. And, you know, and Jesus said, I mean, Jesus said all the Course in Miracles is very simple language 2,000 years ago. He said, resist not evil, but overcome evil with good. So fighting the Quaker church or another race or religion or gender or nation, it's all resisting evil. Jesus was saying, rise to the consciousness of wholeness. Rise to the consciousness of inner peace. Rise to the consciousness of love. And from that consciousness, you have a chance to affect lasting change. Martin Luther King said, you cannot create, you have no morally persuasive power with someone who feels your underlying contempt. So that hatred, that anger is the thing that drops a wedge between you and the thing you're trying to change. And the big delusion of ego is that the problem is out there. The Course in Miracles says the problem is in here. The problem is how you're thinking about it. Not to say that things could not change for the better out there. But they're not going to change for the better out there until something changes. And here, this is the essence of A Course in Miracles. Okay, so we're going to have a little fun example now. Let's see if I can get back to this here. Okay. So this is why Jesus said in the Course that miracles enable you to heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death yourself with your mind, with your thoughts, with your beliefs, with your attitude, with your expectations, and you can abolish both. You see, if you made something up, you have the power to change it. But if you believe that something else was made up independent of you and you're a victim of it, you cannot change it because you have externalized it and projected it and made it seem as if it's bigger and more powerful and more real than you are. So you have to own what you see before you can change it. What does owning mean? It means that you, you accept it as a projection of your thoughts. I'm projecting this. It didn't happen to me. I happened to it. The world, you are not in the world. The world is in you, in your head. Now, here's the fun part. Jesus said in the Course, this is one of the 50 principles of miracles. You are a miracle capable of creating in the likeness of your creator. The power of God is given to you to create your reality. I'll tell you why I like writing novels. I've had three or four novels. And the fun thing about a novel is that your God is the writer. You're creating the entire novel. The good guys, the bad guys, the love scenes, the sex scenes, the, the murders, the, the, the ecstasies, the insights. It's like a blank pile. It's your painting. And it's like, and whatever, in my novels, <laughs> what I say goes, maybe it's ego, but it could be creativity. What I say goes in my novel, and when the novel will turn out, you know, if I don't like a character, I can off them. If I love them, I can make them king of the universe, whatever. So when, when your life is your novel, it's not happening to you, it's happening from you. So it says everything besides the creations of God that come for you are your own nightmares. So what does this mean? It means that everything that is of God is true. Love, forgiveness, compassion, uh, patience, kindness, gentleness, trust. These are the attributes of God. And when you create like God, boy, you're powerful because the power of God is behind you. When you make something up, everything else is your own nightmare and does not exist, which means that if something you've created is unlike God, if it's made of fear or war or abuse or intimidation or death or illness, it's a nightmare you made up with your mind. And it's not real because the substance of God is not in it. Only what God is in is real. 
Everything else is a story. It's just a story you made up. And find this, Jesus seals it by saying, only the creations of light are real. How cool is that? Of course, it says in Lesson 244, I am in danger nowhere in the world. Why? Because there's nothing outside me that can hurt me. Why? Because all the world is, is a projection of my mind. And all I can do is hurt myself by holding dark thoughts. There's another lesson later on in the workbook that goes, I will not hurt myself again today. How do you hurt yourself? By holding thoughts that you're hurtable by holding thoughts that you're vulnerable, by holding thoughts that there's a world out there that's more powerful than you are. Got it? It's a diff all different ways of saying the same thing. And I have one more movie clip. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, let me find, okay. This is, this is from The Little Buddha. And it's a great, great movie starring Keanu Reeves, of all people, as the Buddha. I think it came out maybe in the 90s, early 90s, something like that. And it's a dramatization of the life and enlightenment of Buddha. And once again, I'll tell you the story, then we'll come back to it. So it starts out in modern day times. And the idea is that um, they're looking for a new high lama. And they designate these three children who could be the next lama. Uh, uh, and so they they, they kind of weave an old time story into it. And they take these children back to a, a dramatization. They show them how the Buddha himself got enlightened. And there's this moment where he's sitting under the Bodhi tree and he's meditating. And these children are watching him. It's kind of like two different realities that merge, two different timelines that merge. And he makes up his mind that he's going to sit here until he's enlightened. I don't care what happens around me. I don't care what illusions come up around me. I'm going to sit and I'm going to hold the light and I'm going to not be afraid and I'm going to get enlightened. Of course, it says that you are not changed by what is changeable, which means that as a spiritual being, you're immortal, you are eternal. You are deathless. You cannot be sick. You cannot die. The real you cannot change. Now, there's stuff that goes on that comes and goes and is born and dies. It's all the maya. You know, Hindus call it maya and Buddhists call it maya. So there's a difference between what can change and what cannot change. You and I are what cannot change. And that is our leverage to deal with what seems to change around us. So uh, Ramana Maharshi, that's not him, but that's, that's, that's a picture. Ramana Maharshi was a great Indian sage who lived until around 1950. He was an enlightened being. And he said that a dreamer dreams that all the characters in his dream must wake up before he can wake up. Very profound. So what it means... <clears throat> is that if you say, I cannot be happy until all of the characters in my dream are happy, you're actually giving undue power to the characters in the dream because your happiness does not depend on the elements of your dream. Your happiness depends on your mind and your choice. So in practical terms, say, well, I can't be happy until everybody in the world is happy. Well, you just set up another dream. That if you, if you wait for somebody else to be happy before you can be happy, you're going to delay your happiness. And so you don't need anybody else to change before you can wake up. That's the bottom line. I can't, I can't be happy until my husband's nicer to me. 
I can't be happy until my kid gets into prep school. I can't be happy until I get a raise. I can't be happy until COVID goes away. I can't be happy until the economy recovers. I get my job back. Well, all those are ego tricks creating a false gap between where you are and where you want to be. That you can be happy now by waking up. And the whole purpose of The Course of Miracles is to get us to wake up from the dream that seems oppressive, but really it's not. We oppress ourselves with our thoughts. Interesting, isn't it? I hope that guy wakes up. <laughs> um, okay, it's a little bit long to summarize. It says, There was a band, you know, remember the, there was a, a band called The Band many years ago, and they had a song called, When You Awaken, You Will Remember Everything. So what this phrase is saying is that when you finally wake up, you will see the truth that was hidden because you were dreaming. And the Course also says that in many ways that people wake up, some have a a moment of enlightenment like Ramana Maharshi. Um, some have meditation and they see God. Some people have a near-death experience. Some people take psychotropic drugs. Um, you know, there are many ways that people wake up. Some do a lot of yoga. And what it's saying is that when you wake up, everything that you thought was so real before you woke up will have no reality for you. And finally, it says the kingdom and all that you have created there will have great reality for you because they are beautiful and they are true. So this is coming back to the theme that only that which matches God is true. And even in the very early lessons of the Course, it has one lesson where it wants us to identify with the attributes of God. God is love. And therefore, I am love. God is whole. Therefore, I am whole. God is compassionate. Therefore, I am compassionate. God is peaceful. Therefore, I am peaceful. God is good. And therefore, I am good. And so a lot of the course is about getting us to shift our identity from our neurosis and our fears and our body and our history to identify only with that which God, only with that which God is. All that God is, I am. All that God is not, I am not. So when you say, oh, I, I'm sick and I'm, uh, they, they told me I'm ADD or I'm a sex addict or um, I have this particular disease or I'm, I'm narcissistic. Now, all those things have reality at a very shallow, thin strip of existence. But behind them all, they're just labels that we put over God. If you remember paper mache, you take a balloon and you put those strips of wet newspaper over it, and you make a nose and you, you know, make a face. Well, we're the balloon, so to speak, the pure balloon. And then the world puts strips of paper mache over it, and we form a nose and a face and a color and a gender. But who we are is the one inside where all that stuff will go away. So be very careful what you fill in the blank with after you say, I am. This is a key teaching here. Whatever you say, I am, is you tend to reinforce and you're just so I'm, I'm screwed up. Well, then you get the experience of being screwed up. Um, I'm a bad husband. I'm a bad mother. I'm a bad wife. I'm stupid. I, I didn't pass the IQ test. I, I failed the SATs. Um, watch what you say I am because that creates a reality. Instead of saying, I am whole. I'm a loving being. I'm a good parent. I'm a patient person. Even if it seems like you're not, you are not the personality. The word personality comes from the Greek word persona, which means mask. So everything that is your personality is a mask. It's not you. The actor wears the mask. And the mask has very different attributes than the actor. Persona, personality, mask. 
So maybe you messed up in your marriage. Maybe you had a bunch of divorces. Maybe you did this and that. So what? That's personality. There's someone in there that's deeper, stronger, clearer, bigger, greater, more perfect than the mass. Don't, Ram Dass said something I've been meditating on for a year now. He said, spiritual masters are just as neurotic as the rest of us. But to them, their neurosis is irrelevant. Don't you love it? Uh, it means that they're as crazy as anybody, but on the human level, on the personality level. But they don't care because they know that who they are is bigger than their neurosis. And, uh, you know, if you know, I know some great spiritual masters and they have their shtick. You know, some marital issues or financial issues. I mean, it's like I know some people who are very, very cool, high level teachers. And they have little things going on in their world that you would not see, you know, judges being worthy of a spiritual master, but they don't care about it. They're not busy trying to improve themselves. They know that who they truly are cannot be improved. They have learned to identify with their deep, deep self rather than the human problems. And we would do well to do the same. This is a big lesson today. There's a lot in here. I hope you're getting it. It's all the same thing from different angles. You understand? Uh, it may seem like different different things, but really it's all one. Let's close up and then we'll get on to questions. So I guess that was the last that was the last slide. So what we want to do is this identify from the elements of the dream and identify with a dreamer. I am a mind creating a dream. I am not the dream that some other mind has created. And then, you know, just like this young lady here, it's a beautiful morning and she's waking up and she's stretching and there's new life. You know, how do you feel on a really good morning when you woke up from a really good dream? And of course, we'll say, well, you, you didn't really wake up. You went from one dream to another, but we won't go into that now. But we want to have that wonderful, refreshing feeling of, ah, oh, that was just a silly dream. What was I thinking? And then you realize that who you are is bigger than anything you thought. That's why a coat hanger is the same as a, as a light bulb and a cancer is the same as a cut because you're all equal element. They're just all part of the same movie that's running across the screen. And you're not the movie and you're not the screen. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Okay, uh, let's move on to Q&A. Uh, perhaps Nishank has been catching some, and I'll do the best I can in the time allotted. We've got a lot in. 43 yes. minutes, we've got a lot in. Yeah, some lovely clips. And uh, based on one of those videos where uh, the, uh, the fired arrows turn into rose petals, uh, yeah. Susan asks that, uh, what can we do? What role can we play? How can we dissolve uh, the illusion of COVID-19? By remembering that we are spiritual beings and that spiritual beings cannot be sick. A virus cannot touch a spiritual being. As a divine being, you're automatically immune from anything that doesn't match God. And so you cannot afford to watch long newscasts of statistics of COVID-19. You cannot afford to watch projections, predictions of all the deaths that are going to happen. You cannot afford to engage in gossipy conversations or fear-based conversations. Every time you immerse your mind in the facts and figures of the news, you become a part of the news. So you have to remember Nishank's household, where 10 people we're in intimate contact with somebody who was COVID positive, and none of them were touched in the least by it. Not one of them had one symptom, and that's possible for anybody. And you have to have compassion for the people who are hurting, but you also have to recognize that behind their apparent disease or death, there is a spiritual being who is absolutely whole and was never touched by it in the first place when you are willing to see others as whole spiritual beings and see yourself as a whole spiritual being, you rise to a whole different level of immunity that empowers you in ways that being immersed in the disease cannot. I am whole. I am perfect. I am as God created me all as well. That's the mantra for somebody who wants to maintain their spiritual immunity. Thank you, Alan. 
and uh, you at the at the onset after my story you spoke about uh, parallel reality so yeah. we have a question on that celia is a, a hospice rn i think that would mean nurse and she says so many of my patients have been someone who tried to ignore and heal their cancer without traditional medicine and by choosing a different reality but uh, their cancer got so bad by the time they came to the hospice that they had very difficult and painful deaths so which and it was difficult to manage the system uh, the symptoms so uh, why didn't it work for these patients to heal their cancer when they were actively ignoring and choosing a healthy lifestyle yeah that's a good question isn't it so the course says that if you look in the teacher's manual um i forget the exact title of the chapter but it says who is the physician and who is the patient and it says the real physician is the mind of the patient and it says that the the patient chooses a physician who will generate the results that the patient chooses and if the patient chooses to be healed they will choose a physician that heals them and if they choose not to be healed then they will choose a physician who will not heal them and it says that it says actually you don't need the physician at all you could choose to be healed or not be healed without the agent it says the physician is the agent who plays out the the a the patient's intentions so in a case like that i have to believe that on some level the patient was choosing to leave this world we don't know why you cannot look into somebody else's destiny you cannot look into their someone their soul contract that's between them and god if they you know there are plenty of people who choose alternative means and they get healed there are plenty of people who use traditional oncological means and they get healed there are people who choose alternative and don't get healed people who choose oncological and they don't get healed so so really it's not so much the method that matters but it's the ultimate choice of the patient who is generating the result of their soul's choice now the personality may may not want to die none of us do but at a very soul level you just have to assume that their days the number of their days was chosen as a soul contract between them and their higher power and that was one way they got off the stage they fulfilled their soul contract so in some cases of cancer other people have heart attacks and strokes and people have car accidents and they fall off of bridges I mean there are many many different ways that people exit stage left. And so the method of exiting is really less significant than the choice that it's time to exit for whatever reason which is unfathomable to the human mind but it, it makes sense from a when you drop into a divine mind level. Um uh, people who truly choose to be healed get healed and people who choose not to be healed do not get healed. It's nobody's fault. Not the doctor's fault. It's not their fault. It's not about blame or guilt. It's about a very deep level of choice that transcends the intellect, which will not understand this, no matter how much I explain it. <laughs> okay, I hope that's helpful. It's a big topic, and I hope I did a little bit of justice. Yes. And Alan Shukin asks uh, if you can. Uh, I think a lot of it you've already spoken on this session. Uh, there is a very bold line mentioned in Lesson One Thirty Two of the Course in Miracles, which says there is no world. and this is the central thought the course attempts to teach so alan can you uh, speak a little more than what you said about uh, in yeah. the session yeah um a, friend, a teacher a spiritual teacher mind said that fear is not real because if it were then everybody would be afraid of the same thing so if i'm afraid of snakes but you're not and you're afraid of heights but i'm not and you're afraid of spiders and i'm not and i'm afraid of water and you're not it shows that there's nothing inherently scary about snakes spiders water or heights it means that we've made up a story that you know snake i don't like snakes but i've seen people who like snakes that people have pet snakes people some people let snakes wrap around them i i don't not my not, not my idea of fun so What is a snake? Is a snake scary? Well, it really depends on your belief about a snake. Um 
there's, a, there's an old Hindu parable about a guy who goes to visit a friend out in the country and he gets up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and he sees on the ground a deadly snake coiled up about to strike him. And in the morning, the host comes and finds the guy dead on the ground and next to him is a coiled up rope. And the, the guy thought it was a snake, but it was a rope. And he had a heart attack, he was scared, but he's just as dead <laughs> as if it was a snake. Of course, says that illusions are as strong in their effects as the truth. That's something to think about. Illusions are as strong in their effects as the truth. So there's very little agreement about the world is because there's nothing that the world actually is. The world is basically an opinion in your mind and mine. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. So there is no world. That means it's, it's not what you think it is. It's, it's, it's an idea. It's not some solid thing out there. It's, it's something that you're projecting from in here out. It's, it's, it's not the real world. It says there's the God's world and the ego's world, and they're not the same really. God's world is all that is good, and the ego's world is all that has form and is threatening. So that's the world that is not. Thank you, Alan. I think you yourself has had that rattlesnake experience that you shared in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Once I was... <laughs> walking in the woods and I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I noticed I was just about to step on a rattlesnake and I jumped back and the rattlesnake was no happier to see me than I was a bit. It just slithered off into the, into the woods. And the funny thing was I was not scared in that moment because I just knew what I needed to do. But as I'm walking down the, thought, the, the path, I think, well, that rattlesnake could have killed me. That was pretty scary. <laughs> it was like in the moment there was no fear but as the mind came in, I thought about what could have happened. Then I got afraid after the fact. <laughs> it was kind of silly. But that was a story I made up about the rattlesnake. Yeah. I think the, the, sto the Hindu story about the rope and the snake mm -hmm. and the guy dying uh -huh. answers Josephina's uh, question, if you could uh, elaborate on the line. The world, as I see, is a projection of my mind. I think that pr pretty much answers it, right? Yeah, yeah. When, so when I lived in Fiji, they had a shark dive. And there was a little, um, uh, they would take you offshore, not near my house, actually. And uh, the people would go down and they would feed sharks meat. <laughs> and they, this, they'd, pay, pay, they'd pay a lot of money to go feed sharks meat. And they thought it was fun. You know, this I, I didn't I didn't do that, but that was their idea of fun. Were they afraid of sharks? Not at all. They they were at peace with sharks. And by the way, do you know that that cows kill more people every year than sharks? People are mostly afraid of sharks, but there are more cow deaths than there are every year than sharks. And there are more people in the state of New York who get bitten by another person in the course of one year than the number of people who die of shark deaths all around the planet. <laughs> so if you, if you want to protect yourself, stay away from cows and people biting you in New York because they're scarier than we're actually more dangerous than sharks. Okay, uh, anything else there, Nishank? Yeah, Alan, one last. Okay. Uh, that's a good okay. one. Uh, so there's, uh, yeah, it, it speaks, the question uh, wants you to answer about uh, thinkers and doers. So whether yeah. uh, Thoreau, yeah. Gandhi, all who took active roles in addressing social injustice and uh, do not some of the same injustices we saw in their day are similar in our world and even in the US today and summon us to not only uh, be in a state of enlightened awareness, but even action, enlightened action. Certainly, certainly. And being a social change agent is not antithetical to A Course in Miracles. The question is not, I, do you want to change things for the better, but how? And Ram Dass used to say that somebody who's screaming for peace is sending out a set of vibrations that are causing war. And if you look at the great social change agents over history, they were basically peaceful, nonviolent people. You look at Abraham Lincoln, and Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa and Gandhi and there's other nonviolent agents of uh, social movements. 
And the only reason these people were truly successful, I mean, Gandhi liberated a whole nation from British rule without causing a big war. He, 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 was, he was, had ahimsa, nonviolence. So, you know, it's certainly possible to change things that weren't working 100 years ago and still are not working. And probably 100 years from now, there'll still be some things that are not working. But the question is, what is your attitude while you're trying to change them? You, you cannot just change pieces on the chessboard. You have to change your mind so that you're sending out a set of en uh, an energy field that's going to lift people to a higher consciousness rather than just keep going around, 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 around. So only, only real social change comes from higher consciousness, which the Course in Miracles would call miracle mindedness. And there are many, many great social change agents who are Course in Miracles students, and they're effective because they have love in their heart rather than fear or resistance. Okay, well, um, we covered a lot of territory. It's a big, big chapter today. I hope it's been useful to you. Let's close our eyes for a few moments of meditation before we say aloha. Thank you, Nishank. Thank you, everyone who is participating today live or to the recording. Take a moment to look inside yourself behind your personality, behind your physical form, behind your finances, behind your relationship. And there is something inside you, look for it now, that is absolutely shining. There's a you that has never been touched by the world. Never been touched by the dark events of childhood. Never been touched by relationship betrayals. Never been touched by a disease or diagnosis. There's an essence of you that transcends anything in form and anything that happens in the world. So take a breath now and drop into the real you, the divine spark, the life force that is God, the wholeness that is holy. Of course, the miracle says, you are holy. I am holy just as I am. Not holier than anybody else, just holy. I am created in the image and likeness of a perfect God. Anything less than perfection does not befit me. Even as I go through the human journey and the dance of relationships and finances and bodily things, there's a me that is bigger than all of that. So today I make a monumental decision. I identify with God. I'm not the only God, but I'm an expression of God. I identify with beauty and kindness and compassion and trust and patience. Everything that is absolutely wonderful and pure and holy, I am. Everything else is a dream. I choose now to awaken from the dream of smallness and limitation. I'm coming home. This is the entire parable of the prodigal son, prodigal daughter. After wandering in a far country, becoming frustrated and agitated and suffering, 
and they can come home. My father, mother, God welcomes me with open arms saying, wow, we sure missed you. Glad you're home. Welcome home, child. Welcome home. If you're ready to take another deep breath, or maybe you'd like to stay in this meditation after we close, that's fine too. Whatever you do, let's take this lovely, centered, clear, empowered awareness into our day, our evening, our life. We're awakening from the dream, coming home to the magnificent truth of who God created us to be. Have a lovely day, a lovely week, all is well. You are a blessing to the world. And so it is.